Hi, I'm Owen Vallis, professor of music technology at California Institute of the Arts. We're taking a look at blocks, part of the new Reactor 6. And today, we're going to take a look at the sequencers and see how we can create an entire song out of just the blocks themselves. To start, let's take a look at this panel layout here. We have here a mixer, three different sequencers, a clock source, and a variety of different filters and oscillators. Let's go ahead and hear what this sounds like. I'm going to turn up the master volume on our main mixer. So this patch is really designed to show how hooking up the different sequencers can lead to a lot of flexibility, as well as demonstrate some of the blocks we have yet to see. So let's start in this video by looking at the sequencers. Generally, we need a clock source to drive our sequencers. This clock divider object here allows us to take our single clock source and split it into six different individual but slower clocks. This is useful if I want to drive something at, say, a 16th rate, but then also have quarter notes and eighth notes or something like that. The sequencers themselves, we'll see how we can configure those in a minute, but are basically patching into each other. So we'll see how the output of this one is actually driving the root pitch of this one. We're also using this sequencer down here to drive our percussion sounds. Let's open up the structure view and see how all of this is connected. So while well, previously we had had a note in block, here we're doing a block that sends out just a clock signal. We can see here we get a gate and a reset. The reset is essentially once you're done with a cycle, it'll send out a signal. We can use this to re-trigger or reset sequences that are not the same length as our original one. A concrete example of this would be if I had 16th notes coming out, but a sequence of say seven or nine steps. This is going to kind of phase over top of that 16th note sequence, but on the reset, it'll start back at zero. This could be a great way to create evolving sort of sequences that then reset on each down. This is being fed into our clock divider module. We can see we get six separate outs. If we go back to the panel here, I have the ability to click on any of these outputs and change the number. As the number goes higher, the clock slows down. The way to think about this is that this number represents how many clocks I need to take in before I'll produce one out. So if I set it at one, that means I'm just passing the clock through. This one up here though says, for every 16 clocks I get in, I'm only passing one out. Essentially, this is a way for me to send out one trigger per bar. Let's jump back into our structure. I'm also directly hooking the gate and resets up to our sequencers. So this gate controls our sequencer, which if I do the split view and jump back to the panel, we can now see that I'm highlighting this sequencer here, which has the main melody section. This bottom row here is being driven by the gate input, and the reset causes this to restart at the next down here. So you can see my reset is actually set to 15, which means it gets to this last step here and will jump back. But since this is an eight step sequence, we get all the way to the end, then on the 15th, it jumps back. 
Again, this is a powerful way to make sure that your sequences all realign at a certain point, but that they don't all have to be the same length or even multiples of each other. Let's take a look at the controls inside our sequencer interface here. By clicking on these, I can turn on or off a gate for this step. Up above, this allows me to tie or glide between the notes. Clicking and dragging here allows me to change what note is played at the pitch output of the sequencer. And the little number below tells you what octave you're in. Further up above here, we have some choices about how the sequencer jumps around. We can play forwards, reverse, ping pong back and forth, or we can even have like a random sort of jostling around where it just jumps from position to position. We can also choose the number of steps. So even though I have values for all eight steps, it will only play the first two. And then I can also choose an offset. So now it'll play these three, which are an offset of three from the original position. Let's reset all that back. We can increase the glide time between the tied notes and the gate effectively chokes the gate. We can either say, I'm gonna take the gate value supplied by the clock, or each step has its own on and off. Lastly, we can manually reset, which will reset the sequence back to the beginning, regardless of what the clock is doing. I can tell it to track the pitch or not track the pitch coming into the input of the sequencer, which we'll see in a second how we can use that to change the root note of our whole sequence. And we can also choose to use an external gate. Let's take a look at what we're doing with these sequencers. We're taking the pitch output of this second, much slower sequencer, which as you can see here is jumping octaves as well as playing the G. And we're feeding that into the input here in our melodic sequencer. What this essentially does is transposes our sequence up and down. I'm gonna turn the audio back up and we'll hear how that's affecting the sound. So we can hear it transpose down, it transposed up an octave. Now it's playing the G, and then it's going back. You'll also notice on that sequencer that we've applied some random direction, which means that the sequence won't repeat itself, but sort of randomly changes over time in a controlled way. Connecting these random sequencers together can create an evolving patch that seems to have a full composition to it, even though it's really just kind of randomly bubbling along. It can add a lot of interest into the composition and prevent it from seeming like a very static and small loop with just the eight steps. Down here, we're taking in the reset, but we're taking in a gate input from our clock. This gate input allows us to slow down that percussion sound. So right now, it adds a setting of one, which means it's as fast as our main clock. But I'm gonna go ahead and use the mixer here at the bottom to turn down the melodic part and listen just to this sort of pulsing percussion part. And we'll notice that if I change the number here, it'll slow down. We'll also notice that it's receiving the reset message, which is forcing it to jump back to the beginning. Let's jump back into the structure here. So we've seen how our sequencers can take in a clock input, how we can subdivide our clock input, how we can take the pitch output of our sequencer and use it to transpose another sequencer's mo melody or any other information we want to send out from there. And we haven't really talked about the outputs of the sequencers, but essentially we can send pitch values, which we set at the top there, and gate values, which is that bottom one, whether or not we've turned on or off that particular step. The last piece in this video I want to go over is the clock itself. We can tell it to run internally, which means that it, it listens to its own BPM, and we can set that here. This is 
totally independent of the BPM you've set for your digital audio workstation or here in Reactor. We can set it to external and you'll notice that now it is slave to what our transport is doing. This is the mode you would want if you wanted your sequencer to run and have it sync up with whatever your digital audio workstation was doing. We can apply shuffle. We can disable the reset and set the number of steps when the reset trigger is sent. And we can also set the clock amount or rate rather over here. So this here means that we'll have 16th notes at the external tempo. Whereas here's eighth notes, quarter notes, all the way down to 30 second notes. Having a very high resolution main clock and using the clock divider can be a powerful way to send many different subdivisions to all of your different sequencers. In the next video, we'll take a look at some of these boutique filters that we have yet to use. And we'll see how that they are powerful tools for shaping your sound. If you want to learn more about Reactor, join us at cadenze.com. Our course will be going over how to build synthesizers from scratch using Reactor Primary.